and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. Um, my name is Peggy Plore, and I am the host of this uh, weekly broadcast um, that is put on by Sped Homeschool, as I'm also the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool. Um, but Sped Homeschool empowers families to home educate children with learning struggles. And to learn more about the other resources that we offer families, you can visit our website at spedhomeschool.com. Some of the best resources we have on our website are our blogs, um, products and services offered by our partners, and offered by partners like our um our sponsor tonight, who happens to be Right Shop. And I just want to thank you, Right Shop, for sponsoring this episode of Empowering Homeschool Conversations. You can find out more about them, but halfway through, we'll take a break um, in our conversation and um, hear about their the curriculum that they offer. But um, tonight, we are talking about um, early childhood education programs and why they might not be the best solution or why you might need to approach them differently. I think that's uh, maybe a, a better um, angle to take it at. And my special guest tonight is Marcy um, Meltzer. Um, welcome, Marcy, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to read a little bit of your bio. Um, Marcy is a uh, an intuitive speech language pathologist um, consultant, and she earned her uh, master's in education in speech language pathology from the University of Virginia in 1990. And she's always been interested in providing out of the box intervention methods with clients who demonstrate challenging communication behaviors. Um, Marcy intuitively helps parents identify habits and patterns in their household that are potentially keeping kids stuck in nonverbal communication. When parents understand these habits, she says it's easy for them to make small changes and help their family out comes outcome the blockages to the child's natural spoken language process. She's been helping clients switch their children away from limiting um, communication to um, more functional conversational speech for decades. And so I am so excited to have you back, Marcy. And Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Always happy to talk to the homeschool audience. Oh, well, we I enjoyed our last conversation. And I know as we've been exchanging information this week um, to talk about this specific topic. Um, I, I'm just super excited because I had a child in early education, um, a program, and I found it very frustrating. And so I, I know we're going to address a lot of those things as why we get frustrated and, and all of that. But, um, and, and I see we have some viewers popping on. And if um, you're watching with us live, just know that you can join this conversation. We have the ability, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or on Twitter, you can put comments in the feed and we will see those. And we would love to build those into our conversation. So if you have any questions or comments as we're going along, definitely um, add those or even just do a shout out where you're from. And um, we'd love to say hi. So, um, so yeah, so as we get started, Mercy, I would um, just welcome you to, to talk a little bit about yourself and your educational philosophy and how it's kind of morphed um, as you work with children and families, because that, that kind of was, um, it was very evident in your bi bio as I read through it that this is where you started, but this is kind of where you are now and working with families and, and what led to that progression yeah, so thank you again for having me on. Like I said, I love to talk to homeschool families because my platform, Waves of Communication, I developed to equip and empower parents of children who are late talking. And mm -hmm. late talking just means they're not good at using spoken language yet. Um, mm -hmm. because the whole point that I like to talk about over and over again is that, you know, all humans are wired for spoken language mm -hmm. and we all have a need to communicate with other humans from the time, even before we're born, right? You always yeah. know as the mom, right. what does the baby want, right? While you're pregnant, <laughs> uh -huh. they start communicating with you through energy even before mm -hmm. they're born. But as soon as they are born, it's with cries and mm -hmm. behavior behaviors. And it's exactly. the parent and caregiver's job to figure out what all that means mm -hmm. and translate it and meet the child's needs and then teach mm -hmm. them new things. And, and basically that philosophy is what I kind of really wanted to get back to. Um, over the past sort of decade and a half, 
Uh or two, maybe, things really have shifted from this intuitive way that I just described that all parents naturally do with kids Mm -hmm. has helped them evolve from crying to conversation, step by step, you know, naturally. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the system with early identification Mm -hmm. and early things, even before children are two years old, are being identified as not doing, we talked about this before, either Mm -hmm. not doing something. And and one of those primary key uh, ticks on normal development by the two Mm -hmm. year check mark is how many words the child's saying, right? They always get that question. Mm -hmm. And if they're not getting the doctor or whoever is not Mm -hmm. getting that standard, oh, at least 50 words and, you know, starting to Mm -hmm. combine words in two word sentences by their second birthday. You know, if they've got one of these kiddos who maybe during COVID has spent a lot of time, you know, with parents who are working at home while they're with Mm -hmm. nannies or Mm -hmm. with technology or, or, you know, just with siblings, they're not in daycares and school programs with other kids. They're are just really not very exposed to language. And so they aren't talking yet by the time they get to be 18 months or two years. And of course, if they're not talking yet by 18 months or two years, they're using more elevated behaviors. It's way beyond crying, right? Now mm-hmm. they're climbing cabinets and use pulling you around and pointing to things. But uh-huh. communication still happens. It, it is, right. Exactly. It's that just is. The, the philosophy that I've adopted is that it's not necessary to send your kid out to expose them to the spoken language they missed mm-hmm. while they were on tech or having ear infections or maybe premature or Mm -hmm. a million other reasons that they Mm -hmm. didn't hear the spoken language they needed and now they're late. And so instead of labeling them suddenly with early, and that's what happened in the past 20 years, it was about Mm -hmm. earlier and earlier, early, because we didn't want kids to fall through the cracks. And so that's where these early identification and then with the inventive, um, of of autism spectrum disorder and when that came along and we could label every kid along that spectrum and that was the chain the the cash release right as soon as they get on that label then they can have more frequent therapy or or they'll get it for free or something Mm -hmm. like that when they get that label but then with the label a system has to provide more. So if they've got more kids being diagnosed, which is what happened mm-hmm. uh, and with these this autism spectrum, then the the prescription that goes with the diagnosis is mm-hmm. five days a week therapy. So the schools are opening these early childhood autism centers for these kids that are late talking, but right. being identified as having these diseases because once they d- d- identified as having a, a disease, then they get funding. So right. th- that's yeah. where these programs are growing and growing and growing and popping up and taking kids earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier early intervention, Mm -hmm. you know, with more structured intervention, because what can a therapist do with a tiny child at 18 months old to three years old to five years old in a half an hour a week? How can they teach them anything in one Mm -hmm. session? They can, if they are the ones who are responsible for facilitating that improvement, they can't possibly get it done in a very limited amount of time. And that's where the frequency increases. Yeah. So, so that really leads into a a good question though, as to why were these programs established? Because I think that understanding is key to understanding that. Yeah. While it, you know, while Yes, well, they're often sold as bring your child here to get them caught up. In fact, that's where they started was it, it was parent infant education, how to teach a parent, right, how to uh-huh. teach their uh-huh. kids, how to talk back. You know, when I first uh-huh. started, it was you had these early services because uh-huh. your child had real big illnesses. They were it was only the only ones that got them were kids who were real premature or drug exposed uh-huh. or very, very ill. Right. 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 And so kids who were just developmentally delayed because of environmental things, they didn't qualify for these programs because mm-hmm. they didn't have a real medical illness that was 
the parent's responsibility until some studies came out that proved that, in fact, you can train these things that kids either are doing or not mm. doing or they're uh, untrained behaviors that they are using instead of speech, oh, right? Okay. And and yeah. they're working at trying to train and program the behaviors the parents are looking for or or in fact, not necessarily the parents are looking for, but the schools are looking for, because these are pre-school training programs. They are not okay. training kids to be successful at home. They are designed mm. to train kids to be successful in school because that's where the that's earlier intervention came from, right? Yes. The earlier mm. we get them in special education, the sooner we get them out of special education is the philosophy. Mm. But the thing is, it's all about having your child be successful when they're in the building. And I saw one of the questions that you had sent me was from a parent, who, a homeschool parent who took their child to a program, right? Mm -hmm. Who, who tried it out. But then when it was came time for actual, you know, they would have to be in the classroom all the time for the Mm -hmm. school. The parent wanted to take that full time education over with homeschooling and they didn't qualify for services, speech therapy anymore, Mm -hmm. because the child's not going to be in a classroom and whatever they were doing, the kid was good enough Mm -hmm. to be understood. And in fact, the parent was told bring them back if you can understand them or if you bring them back and try to put them back in school and they're not successful, then they can get services then. Yeah. And that's yeah. a pretty common um, thing that parents come to us with that question. And I think that basis of understanding is their their perspective is if this child's not in the classroom, this is a an okay thing. But if they're in the classroom, then this is an issue we have to deal with. Right. It's two different places that they're they're evaluating your child from. And in our mindset as a parent, we're thinking this should be evaluated from the same perspective. <laughs> and that we're always looking at this child as being able to function in life. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not just in a classroom, but mm-hmm. everywhere they go, at the park, when making friends, at parties, at when they go to get a job, when they go to, mm-hmm. you know, all those other things. And I think that's, we talked about homeschool parents being very resourceful about a holistic right. education approach mm-hmm. where, again, a parent who has a child who is late talking. And for whatever reason, many kids, one in eight is late talking. So uh, there, you, you had mentioned know. that there are a lot of parents yeah. that signed on to watch this. And so mm-hmm. everyone watching this either has a child who's late talking or knows someone mm-hmm. who had one. And they've been questioned, did they have a diagnosis? If, if they right. tried to go through the system, they probably did, um, unless mm-hmm. their child was high, you know, already starting to say words. But if they were nonverbal by Mm -hmm. three years old, they likely were given an autism diagnosis. I would say Mm -hmm. pretty much 99% unless even, and I I would say unless they came with another medical, but that's not even true because even kids with Down syndrome or premature or seizures, they Mm -hmm. also get the autism diagnosis because it comes with the funding. So Uh, pretty much every, that's why it doesn't really mean anything Mm. to go. Parents will say they've been advised by their doctor to go and get a very expensive developmental evaluation, you know, with pediatricians to get the diagnosis so they can get the therapy and all that stuff. And just remember that you're paying for a systemic solution that is funded through a system, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be catered to your child. It's going to be catered to how do we mold your child into a systemic situation? Because, you know, again, that's what mass education is, public Mm -hmm. education is. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, because that's kind of like that ages, stages, here's our checklist, um, and how that all fits into when a child is within this programs, and and then maybe kind of flipping it as to a parent who is not within that system and how we should look at it differently. Because I think we get stuck in this, that it's this true. is where my child is, and this is where they're not, and we got to, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. So it's very easy right nowadays to get these guidelines. Ages and stages is one of them. There are checklists to determine what is normal and there's Mm -hmm. checklists to determine what is abnormal. What are the signs of ADHD? Mm -hmm. What are the signs of autism? What are the signs? Because at home, a parent is triggered because they're experiencing issues around, like we said, either a child is doing some communication behavior. And by the way, all behavior is communication. A tantrum is communication and isolation is communication. It's Mm -hmm. all communication. So a child is doing some communication behavior that you don't understand or you don't Mm -hmm. want to continue. It's not pleasant for your household. You don't (laughs) like it, right? Either that's happening (laughs) or... Or there's, it's not, right? You want that, whatever it is, to turn into something that you want conversational, natural spoken language that everybody can understand. Mm -hmm. And somehow, again, that process, when you think about it from a parent perspective, Mm -hmm. it's easier to understand, okay, my child's doing this communication behavior. How do I move them into something else? But the school doesn't have that background knowledge of your child. Again, it's all about how many of these kids can we pass through first grade, second grade, third grade. And we're teaching Mm -hmm. them to the test because it's all Mm -hmm. based on success is based on test Mm -hmm. scores and, you know, Mm -hmm. this evidence because, um, yeah, data, data speaks to systems. And so the thing is, it it speaks to parents then, right? They look and they're like, if the school thinks this is what the standard of success is, then Mm -hmm. I must hold my child to the same Mm -hmm. standard because I have taken the responsibility to be a homeschool mom or whatever. And so what I suggest is that you look at your standard of success based on your child's ability Mm -hmm. to evolve. Are you seeing improvement every day Mm -hmm. in this area Mm -hmm. of concern? Because you're going to have to take the effort. You know, you talked about how that's Mm -hmm. your job. You're in charge. You're the the headmaster of your school. So if the goal of the week, you know, again, you're establishing your curriculum and maybe Mm -hmm. algebra is the highlight this month because your child's got a big algebra test they're studying for to get into a school or something like that. But with these little kids, what's going to make them successful? Like you're getting to study for that algebra test to get into that school to do that thing to do with or whatever. Your kids communication using speech is going to help them be successful everywhere. And if they're not, Mm -hmm. if they're not successful with talking, that should be the number one priority. Mm -hmm. It's the Mm -hmm. first scaffold skill that every child needs. I think that's why parents freak out because they're not talking and so they push their Mm -hmm. kids to make them talk more and the the idea behind this is remembering the intuitive thing that's why we talked about at the very Mm, beginning what is the approach here that you want to be using you don't want to be like the therapists that don't understand that when Mm. your child looks at you sideways it means they gotta go potty you know (laughs) you know because you know that Uh and and it's gonna take someone else a real long time to figure that out out, but if you yeah. learn how to interpret that into step by step, every time your child right. looks at you sideways, you know mm-hmm. what to do with that behavior to turn it into spoken language. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you do it with everything. You turn right. into a language facilitator and mm-hmm. you find those changes. And then when your child has spoken language, they can tell you about, I like this, or I don't like this, or I want to go here, or I don't want to go here, or I do right. feel like that. Because until then, every parent and caregiver is just guessing those things. Exactly. You're just guessing. Yes. And That's and you're not accurate really all the funny. time. The older mm-hmm. the kids get, the more they isolate, the more they whatever, the less accurate you get at guessing and reading your mind, the less mm-hmm. they'll even rely on you to do that. And then the whole thing right. breaks down. And that's what we talk about blockages, mm. where what a, my advice to a parent, if you're feeling frustrated by communication behaviors you don't want to see or lack Mm -hmm. of speech, then start to think about the root of this. Where Mm -hmm. can you connect with your child better? Where can you talk to them more and provide them more spoken language? Because they're missing Mm -hmm. 
the models and demonstrations for the language they need. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. It's that simple with this. Now, I have ways to go about it. And the problem that happens with parents is that they get off track. They get, Mm -hmm. they forget that, that, they're taking well, we their time and so working at their frustrated time. with the behavior that, right. that uh, yeah. stops us, you know, and I think so. Or think somebody that, else says something yeah. like, oh, how come your kid's not talking yet? Did you Google yes, that thing? Exactly. And then you go and you're triggered by them or something else. And that's mm-hmm. where I intuitively bring parents back to your situation, because it's just mm-hmm. the same if you were competing on a math score or a, a reading arts score or something. Mm-hmm. My kid got an S- XYZ on the SAT and your guy, kid got it's the same. Mm-hmm. You, it, all these kids and there are all these scores and lists are arbitrary. The real progress comes from success. My kids making friends, my mm-hmm. kids communicating oh, with yeah. with familiar strangers and learning from uncles and aunties and mm-hmm. neighbors and the guy at the ice cream shop and, you know, in their community, how Right. We want them to learn how we mm-hmm. learn as adults, because remember, exactly. as adults, we never stop when you mm-hmm. go to the car shop and you, the guy's changing your tire and you say, how does that work? Show me how that goes. Because right. if you're broken yep. down on the side of the road, you use that yeah, knowledge right. later. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it all, it all comes back to that communication piece. And, and I, I think we get so caught up in the, the, the books and the, the comparing it's all about comparing. comparing and see i yeah. think the other mm-hmm. thing that happens is when you compare your child to someone else then automatically you start comparing yourself to other teachers or therapists or whatever and you say like mm-hmm. i need i don't i don't have a degree i don't have expertise i can't figure out how to do this i need to mm-hmm pay someone else, you know, to, to solve this problem for you. And, and again, when you've got a free program that pushes early exposure and early intervention and let us screen your kid. In fact, parents don't often even search for these things first. It happens when they take their kids to the two-year-old checkup or they Mm -hmm. enroll them in a daycare preschool so they can work. And then their free screening pops in from the state and they Mm -hmm. run the checklist on all the kids. And suddenly, they get the note home saying Johnny isn't as good as the other kids in these things or Johnny is doing behaviors the other kids aren't doing and Mm -hmm. now it's your problem right right? yeah to fix your kid to help them be like the other kids and and I think that's the mindset that can really get parents Mm -hmm. I call that the anchor that's just going to sink your efforts you know when you can look at other alternatives as a lifeboat to say you know Mm -hmm. hey this is a communication behavior if I understand what's behind this Mm -hmm. connect with my kid empower him to communicate this idea good bad or ugly Mm -hmm. with other people then they won't judge him as being low iq Mm -hmm. or adhd or whatever they're checklisting right exactly (laughs) because Mm -hmm. other professionals look for disease i call it Mm dis-ease because it's Mm -hmm. there's some problem there's no ease in their program your kid is causing some dis-ease in their program so they look for a Mm dis-ease in your child literally that's what this otherwise their program was made to be successful and your child does not fit into that box yeah no they're breaking it yeah Mm -hmm. you're wrecking it that that, parents will be told your kids reckon it for other kids those behaviors Mm -hmm. unless you fix those behaviors other kids can't learn because of your child think about hearing that from the place that you trust Mm -hmm. to help you because you you wouldn't sign your kid up to go to school unless you felt like they could teach them something you can't right Right. yeah yeah Uh, yeah, well, uh, that or, was the or, response or I got told with my you child you're too. Supposed to so, sign them up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I would love for you to touch a little bit on this getting caught up, because um, we hear it so many times, and it, it it's it's really hard to talk to a parent. So, what what do you tell parents when they say, "Well, I just want to get my child caught up," you know, because that's what the early childhood programs are 
t- tell us that they can do too. So when yeah. our children are get into school, but what? Well, again, the first yeah. question that you want to ask is if it's if it's someone else saying we can help you catch your kid up. Right. Which I know a lot of curriculums and programs out there say they do that. (laughs) Right. We'll help you catch your kid up. Remember, Mm -hmm. that's coming from the lens of comparing your kid to other kids of the same age. Literally the same age. Calendar age. Mm -hmm. Calendar age. Not level of reading. Not Mm -hmm. level of attention. It's just age. It's just yeah. age. If they're, if someone else tells you catch up, uses that word catch up. Now, mm-hmm. if you are thinking in your own head, yeah, he's behind, I got to catch him up, mm-hmm. right? Because they're always looking at curriculum and they're going, well, this is third grade and we're supposed to be in fifth grade. Yeah, yes. that's that the other thing. So, so I don't know how you mm-hmm. tell people to move through curriculum, but you can't jump. You no, got to go step by step. Yes, you got to go through the process mm-hmm. step by step in order of teaching because that's how curriculums are built. Mm-hmm. Skills build on skills, build on skills. Right. And that's how language, spoken language is developed. Skills mm-hmm. build on skills, just like you learn from the guy by observing him fix your car. Now, suddenly you are a little bit of an expert right. on fixing your car. And the more you practice, if you suddenly decided to fix everybody's car and you were inspired mm-hmm. by that auto mechanic visit and suddenly you became to do it because this is what happens to children, right? right. They have oh, yeah. one yeah. experience that mm-hmm. inspires them and suddenly they want to be a ice skater or a soccer player or right. mathematician or mm-hmm. astronaut or something. And now mm-hmm. they can see it on a device and they want to be that yesterday. Okay, so this is what you use Mm -hmm. as your guideline, your inspiration. You see what your child is inspired to learn because you and I talked earlier, life, education, speech development, all of it is trial and error and trial and error and trial and error. So Mm -hmm. if you're motivated, the only way you're going to keep trying and erroring and try again and erroring Mm -hmm. is if you are super excited and motivated about developing that skill. And so if the early childhood program, if your kid loves going there, if they love Miss so-and-so teacher, Mm -hmm. if they love the songs they're singing, if they love the whatever, but you don't feel like they're learning anything, it's not true. They're Mm. exposed to other kids. They are getting experiences that you can't give them. Mm. Unless they're crying and unhappy there, then that's a different situation. But most of them are super pleasant and nice. The Mm. problem is when parents expect them to do the job for you. Right. right. They are yes. giving you experiences that you can't give, but that doesn't mean that you stop giving experiences. Exactly. <laughs> Just yes. when you said a replacement kids. for you. Yes. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I think that's what sometimes, and it's not always a parent's fault, Peggy, because a lot of these teachers and therapists will say, hand it over to me, give me your kid. How many times you've heard that? Give me, I'll take your kid and I'll mold them. I'll get Mm -hmm. them caught up for you. We'll teach them. I'll get them talking. I'll get them whatevering. Mm -hmm. And and it discounts our role. Right. You want to be like, how? How are you doing that? If you're if you're so good and confident that you're going to get this outcome mm-hmm. with my kid, I want to know. And that's where we were getting into mm-hmm. next. I know your next question about yeah. what can you do? What can you do if you have? Because if you are in the early childhood situation and you're in the United States or even anywhere else, and you've qualified for these programs, you're in them, you're getting help, you do whatever. You just want to do your best to use them as a resource, just like like you do the library, the park, every other thing, because you're still, even though you're taking them to a, somebody with a, more letters behind their name than you might have, uh-huh. you're still in control. And you know the goal of what you want to teach. And then you have to really work with that therapist. You don't get to pick, especially in these public programs. You don't get to pick the therapist that you have. Mm -hmm. You might have someone very young. You might have someone Mm -hmm. very experienced. You might have some, your kid might be one-on-one. Your kid might be in a group of five or six kids. They might see a one time a week, eight times a week. Who knows? It's all Mm -hmm. different. Every situation is different. 
but you know your situation with your child Uh and you're in control of the whole rest of your time. This is just one little appointment in your calendar. And they are, you are one little appointment in their calendar, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have to think about it that way. Yeah. Use your time. Yeah. Learn from them. Learn Mm -hmm. from them. And my suggestion is if possible... Can we get to that after the half an hour? Because I know you've got a lot to share on this topic. And I want parents to to stick around for this because Marcy's really going to make this bridge for you as to how you can use these programs and make them beneficial to your homeschool. It's not, we don't want to diss these programs because they they do, ha- they are helpful. This, the therapists there are, can be extremely helpful to your homeschooling efforts. And Marcy's got some ways that you can do that. And so we're going to take a quick break and um, you're going to hear from our sponsor and then I'll bring Marcy back. Let her catch her breath. <laughs> hey, and, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so we'll see you in a second, Marcy. And we're going to hear um, from our sponsor, Right Shop, right now. And I just want to thank Right Shop again for sponsoring this episode of Empowering Homeschool Conversations. Um, so Right Shop asks, how are homeschool writing lessons going for you lately? Are there tears of frustration or long minutes staring at a blank piece of paper because I don't know what to write about? Well, here's the solution, Right Shop curriculum. Finally, a writing program that understands the challenges of teaching writing. Right Shop has options for kindergarten all the way through high school with engaging step-by-step lessons. Right Shop gives students the necessary building blocks of the writing process so there's zero frustration. And Write Shop not only teaches kids how to write, it also shows how to teach. You can learn to you'll learn to guide them through the writing process and inspire even the most reluctant writers. Parents rave about the results. Sherry in Florida says, I'm so pleased with Write Shop. My eighth grader, who was lukewarm about writing and really didn't write too well, is blossoming. And Haley in California says, thank you very much for creating Write Shop. It's been a pleasure to teach this curriculum and the results are phenomenal. Our son went from hating writing to asking for more. You can visit writeshop.com to take the placement test and find out which level best suits your child tween or teen. With Right Shop, teaching writing has never been easier. So thank you again, Right Shop, for sponsoring this episode. And um, they also have Right Shop Junior. Um, and I just did an unboxing of the, um, the Right Shop um, book A. If you want to look on our YouTube channel and see that, you can also um, check that out, what's in involved in that. And um, and so there's there's just a lot of good things. And it was written by a mom who has a struggling writer. So what better teacher than somebody who's been in your shoes? <laughs> yes. yeah, I love that curriculum. What a great yeah. thing, because I think it's all, it's, it's such an intuitive process, right? Mm-hmm. Really inspiring your child to want to write about the things that they're thinking about that get they get excited about well, because yeah. and so the first book I, I was as I was leafing through it as I did the unboxing it's like tell us about yourself well of course this is what a child wants to talk about exactly yes. um, and so we're not just like pulling things out of the air to, to do creative writing but things that they know about and And care about. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to dive into now and I, I, I see we have quite a few viewers watching. Um, so if you want to be part of this conversation with questions specifically related to what we're talking about, um, definitely dive in and put your comments or questions in the feed wherever you're watching from. And um, But Marcy, we're going to kick this off. I know we, we kind of ended the first half an hour in talking about just how these early childhood programs can be resources for parents. And um and how we can approach them just as as homeschool parents so that um, we can get some of those outcomes we're looking for, but um, but with some of our involvement as well. Right. And, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of our involvement first, because right. I know we kind of ended with that is that these teachers can't do it all. Um, yes. And in what can we as parents, what, what perspective do we need to have coming in in using these types of programs? So, yeah, so that's the first important thing is just like in your homeschool situation, even if you're a public school mom or, you know, you've got kids that are going to classes, you are still responsible for helping them be successful there, right? Mm-hmm. You send them, you send them with their 
clothes on. You send them with their right of school supplies. <laughs> you send them with their, you know, tummy full of food and mm. ready to learn, good night's so good. sleep, yep. all that stuff, right? So the same is true for any kind of experience. You mm. want to equip your child and empower them to have a good time there. Just very much like yeah. this curriculum. If your kid's having a good time with mm. whatever, it just in the environment, then mm. they're going to be alert. They're going to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. They're going to be curious about what's going on. If mm -hmm. it's too much, if they're, you know, fight or fight or flight, yeah. then they're going to, you know, withdraw from it. And mm -hmm. again, with any experience, you want your kiddo to get the most out of it. You want them right. to like say, bye, mom. I'm mm -hmm. so good here. I'm learning yeah. without you. And you acknowledge the fact that, I, I get it. This is time that I you've given up. You've given away mm -hmm. to someone else mm -hmm. to care for your child. And and again, the first step is making sure that it's the right place, that they're getting mm -hmm. a good experience. So the, right. the main thing is that they're happy. They're having a good time, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. So right. all... All of that is, you know, the most important just to really have your child enjoy it and then mm -hmm. understand what they're teaching. They're going to tell you, here's our curriculum. Here's what mm -hmm. we're doing. Here's what we're getting. See mm -hmm. it for what it is. Accept it for what it is. It mm -hmm. might be more limited than what you want your child to learn. Then you know that you're going to have to provide the extra. It could right. be better than yes. you ever expected. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're going to teach my kid this and this and this and this. Then you're going to have to learn from them. Right. Yeah. Because if mm -hmm. they are experts and they are intending through this school year mm -hmm. for your kid to develop these skills, then they're going to expect you to help them at home to mm -hmm. get those things going. So the first step is to really communicate about expectations, because this idea yes. of getting your kid caught up, somebody mm -hmm. expects them to work hard try hard and get better because that's the only way it's going to happen for them to move from point A to point B. They expect your child to show up ready to put in effort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so right. the first thing you do is you find out what is expected. What kind of effort are you expecting of my child? What's he expected mm -hmm. to do when he shows up here? And then you help facilitate that. And, and see, first of all, to begin with, is this something my child can do? Do they expect your child to sit and your mm -hmm. child never sits? Then that's going to have, you're going to have a problem if it's mm -hmm. that basic. If they expect your child to do whatever, then you're going to have to let them know. I see that you expect kids to sit for half an hour. At home, my kid hasn't sat for five minutes. How are you? How are you going to get yes. him to sit? Because if right. you want him to do this, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Because they might give you an, a response that you love. You're like, wow, mm -hmm. that works. I'm going to yeah, learn right. from you uh -huh. and do it. Or they could have a method that you don't like right. and yeah. you want to catch that right away. That's so good, either yeah. way, mm -hmm. you want to know what are they going to do exactly. Mm -hmm. And right. if, they're, if you're not there, you definitely want to know. But if all possible, you want to see it with your own eyes. Go yeah. there, sit mm -hmm. there and watch because again, they've already talked to you at their evaluation about these right. are our goals. Mm -hmm. We're getting these done. I want to see how you're doing it. I want to yeah. watch how you're doing it because mm -hmm. again, in a half hour a week, your kiddo's not going to make significant gain. They need you to do the work at home. And so sit in on the session and if at all possible, get the last 10 minutes from the therapist to just Talk to you. Mm -hmm. Ask them questions about the things your kid's doing at home that you want to stop or the thing that, that your kid's not right. doing that They're you want them to learn. Mm -hmm. They are your resource. Tell them, I really wish my kiddo would do this at home. I tried, mm -hmm. but you have to bring information. You right. can't just oh, yeah. say, yeah. tell me how to make my kid talk. 
It mm-hmm. has to be specific, specific. to your problem. Right. Yeah, like, especially if you only have 10 minutes. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. He like every time he's done drinking, he whips his cup on the floor. And that I can't stand that. And it's making my house full of juice. How do mm-hmm. I make that stop? That's right. the kind of question. Oh, yeah that you can ask because they should be able to give you a strategy that you are going to try. Now, is that strategy going to work the first time? Maybe not the second time, the third time, Mm -hmm. but you try it over trial and error, trial and error over the week. Mm -hmm. And by the next week, then it's your responsibility to go back and say, I did it. Mm -hmm. I tried it. This was my result. Tell Mm -hmm. me what to do next. Because, right, because they that's feedback as well right, for them mm-hmm. with with 50, 60 kids on their caseload or whatever, you know, all those kids mm-hmm. they've got to do that. They're, they aren't right. going to keep track of that for you. That's right. your job is mm-hmm. to say, all right, this is the skill I need to have a successful at home. We're right. working on it here mm-hmm. at the school or therapy. How can mm-hmm. I get this happening? Yeah. And mm-hmm. again, if the therapist doesn't, Um, You know, sometimes they have privacy rules or guidelines or things like that. I don't have time to talk to you. I don't have time, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's when you should work it into your plan from the very beginning. If it's not going to be, then can we have a weekly email? Can I connect with you? Because it's it's not a negotiable. It shouldn't be a negotiable this connection time with your child's therapist. It never should be negotiable. Always insist on it. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think just many of the, the, the therapists is what, what I've heard from a lot of people who have been involved in, in both private therapy and the school therapy is that they, um, they, they just feel like their hands are tied with the things that they have to do. And, and a lot of times there are parents that don't want to hear. And so they, a lot of them have just stopped sharing. But, but if you come asking for it, I think they, they're more than likely want. I think so. You know, the thing is therapists in general, I mean, I was a speech pathologist, therapist, you know, Mm -hmm. toting bed, toe, card (laughs) play and all that stuff. I did that for 27 years. I know what it's Mm -hmm. like to be having to work in the system. And remember, it's not necessarily the therapist's fault that they have to work like this, that they have to diagnose these kids early and they have to put them into these programs. In fact, I left the system and literally quit my job because I didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was right for families, but I had to leave my job and start over. If I want, if you still want to work as a speech therapist in the United States, you're pretty much going to have to do it. And you don't have a choice because mm-hmm. that's how you get paid is right. by these systems that mm-hmm. exist this way. And so mm-hmm. as a parent, you just have to have empathy and understand and help them help you use them as a resource. Because right. I promise they didn't sign up to be a speech therapist. It's not easy to be a speech therapist and go to school yeah. to learn that degree. And they mm-hmm. did it because they want to help your kiddo communicate Exactly. Better. Yes. Yeah, that, that is. Yeah. All a, these early childhood point. teachers, especially the old school ones, you know, like me, they know they just want these kids to succeed. And they know that life is tough at home with these tech devices. And that a lot of parents, you know, you can't help with the the kids getting on them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. There's a lot of, there's a lot of kids that are not communicating the way they should because of access to devices. So that's Mm -hmm. a big thing. There's lots of information on my platform about that for parents to follow. So yeah, we have a comment from one of our viewers. She said, I was a parent who said no to ABA 40 hours a week when my child was a toddler. Toddler, 40 hours. She right, just needed time 40 to be hours. A, a kid. And I know we. I one of the questions I had um, in, in my list was, let's talk a little bit about that play versus therapy. And I think that question really brings up a good point. Is, yeah. You know, All right. So especially the with these toddlers, right, we're talking about the littlest kids whose mm-hmm. brains are just 
performing, right? Yeah. And we want them to learn how to be natural, curious learners, trial mm-hmm. and error right. learners, exploring yep. and falling down and seeing what's in their world and learning from their mistakes so yeah. they don't make them again and, <laughs> and all of that right. stuff. And that whole trial and error learning with situations like that comment mm-hmm. we just had, um, it, it untrains the brain. It literally, that t- those toddler yeah. years are when kids learn how to learn through explorative mm-hmm. play. And and without, wow. if you're going to take 40 hours of their week, their waking right. hours, right, mm-hmm. and put them into ABA, which is operant conditioning, it's, it's only structured repetitive activity based on imitation, memorization, teach, yep. test, reward. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and if you take 40 hours of a toddler's life and teach, test, reward, they're going mm-hmm. to become prompt dependent. You're teaching yeah. them to become dependent on mm-hmm. guided learning versus independent mm-hmm. for right. I'm seeking knowledge. What's yeah. that? Yeah. I'm curious about that. Tell me more. Oh, yeah. There is none of that. In fact, that mm-hmm. is untrained when early intervention, especially this intensive stuff happens at these early ages. And what I'm finding it turns out to result in, if you've got parents out there who are deciding this or in this right now, is five or six or seven year old kids that have completely rebelled against mm-hmm. this manipulative stuff because it doesn't move fast enough for their smart minds. They're brilliant. They just oh, yeah, learn how to manipulate exactly. their way out. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because they learn from being programmed. If then, if then, if then, mm-hmm. that if then, okay. So if I pitch a fit when they present mm-hmm. this thing, then they'll quit doing it. And they learn, mm-hmm. oh, your child's pitching a fit now there. And then they'll, they'll bring it back to call your child more diseased, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're the program's not going easily. Your child's rebelling against mm. the program. There must be something wrong with your child. And there is. Mm. At that point, they are completely pigeonholed and unprepared to learn mm. spontaneously from their environment. Right. And that's how we're wired to learn. How we're wired to learn naturally. Right. That's and, what gets why as I made schoolers. We, we naturally want to create lifelong learners and that is just squashing that ability. Exactly. So, yeah. 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 When she talks about, he just needed to be a kid. She's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Kids, brains learn how to learn by play, by being mm-hmm. kids. They can be, they learn to be good students and go to school from being kids. But if that's mm-hmm. untrained, either physically untrained by training an alternative or untrained Mm -hmm. by lack of exposure, either Mm -hmm. way is untrained. Now, the good news is if you do have any parents out there who have older children who have been in this stuff and they're looking Mm -hmm. for alternatives and they feel like their kid's robotic or, you know, they've been kind of trained like that. Mm -hmm. The good news is these brains are very plastic. And this natural learning, like Mm -hmm. you said, because it's naturally wired for exploring Mm -hmm. these opportunities, Mm -hmm. right? You want to create lifelong learners for everywhere you are. That's Mm -hmm. the more natural way to go. So as soon as you stop prompting, forcing, making your kids catch up by Mm -hmm. hurrying them Mm -hmm. along through repeated activities and pressure and things Mm -hmm. like that, before you start doing that, Think about re-getting that natural wiring going. And again, right. if it isn't fun, it isn't fun. Just like the curriculum we talked about, just like yeah. the experiences we talked about, kids mm-hmm. are motivated to learn when they're motivated to learn, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the whole, de- what we call a de-schooling process. Exactly. Schooling. And it's kind of taking that structure out and making learning fun and, and getting to the core of what your child loves. Yeah, and when you start too early with it, schooling, then, you know, like, there's jokes that people talk about. People are going to start taking their kids to a therapist to teach them to walk soon. Like, how soon <laughs> do parents, you know what I mean? It, you guys, as parents, you know your children. And parents mm-hmm. have been teaching mm-hmm. their kids to walk, talk, and read and write themselves mm-hmm. forever, forever. 
yeah. It's, it's good to remember that because, yeah, we think that this is this education establishment, you know, in our mindset, it's been around forever, you know, um, because it's been around for our generation and our parents' generation, and that seems like forever. But um, <laughs> but in reality, it's a very short period of time. And again, that intuitive, natural parenting just continues on. And that's what homeschooling, you know, the beauty of it is. So I, I love that you, you keep pointing back to that because um, we, we have been programmed as parents that we don't have that ability. Oh, yeah, it's so not true. And I don't know, it, it's just unfortunate. I, like I said, I think it's probably in the past 20 years that somehow parents have to give up these mm. responsibilities. And the thing is, and, and parents feel like they can't take the responsibility. It's too mm. hard for them. But yeah, I think that, you know, the, the situation about, about learning and, you know, she says, I, I said, yes, I didn't say yes. I, the other mom, she says, I did say yes, but not till school age, like second grade, hopefully mm. by second grade, your child won't need that level of of working in a highly structured kind of situation because I don't know how old your child is now, but you know, it, you'll learn how to do this. And if you want to, there's resources on my website to, yes. yeah, yeah. to help parents well, learn. You know, as we're wrapping up, I want you to, to talk about that. And I know you have a new product out too. I do. So yes. I to bring up your, your website first. And then I want you to talk about your your cards too. Yeah. So I have a new card deck. It's called the Language Facilitation Inspiration Card Deck. And there's the link. It, you can access them on the website. It is a deck of cards to inspire you. Very similar to the, how this writing curriculum works. They're cards that will um, have an image on one side of a parent interacting with the child and an intuitive message behind that interaction mm. that would come from the mind of a child who's late talking. Like, what's that mm. child saying? And it really is designed to help parents change those nonverbal communication into spoken language. And that mom says that her daughter is 12 and still nonverbal. And this language facilitation process that I'm using with parents is helping even older children, especially older children who have been exposed to a lot of language, help them shift into non, their nonverbal communication into spoken language. Because by 12, they're yeah. using a lot of different kinds facial mm -hmm. expressions, all kinds of things, but there are mm -hmm. some significant things that are blocking it. It mm -hmm. may be physiological, but it probably right. is more environmental and mindset. Mm -hmm. And like you said, this idea of my child has a dis-ease and I mm -hmm. need professionals to teach them um, is not true because we're right. talking about the basics here. We're talking about spoken language. So um, yeah, I promise I am blown away when I had the first five or six or seven year old family where these kids kids were and the behaviors the older they get the behaviors get more extreme because they're they very creative yes. yeah. um they, they so badly want to communicate and they so they, badly want to yes yeah. and mm -hmm. this is the thing because they think it's too hard the parents think it's too hard and when everybody thinks it's too hard that's the mindset that says it's just right. too hard for us we are doomed oh. to be a family full of behavioral communication and it's just not true because mm. neuroplasticity works all brains yeah. are wired to be spoken language users mm -hmm. and I have helped parents I've got the oldest one is 17 um, wow. but the oldest nonverbal the oldest one that was nonverbal and using a tablet system and sign language mm -hmm. and all kinds of things who is now pretty much only using those things for support educational support at school is uh, 14 now Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. That must make so, me feel so good. Oh, it's amazing. And I didn't do it. These parents did it. These right. parents yeah, did it. They worked you with professionals them. and yes. they did it. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. the whole point that, you know, some parents think it's too late. It's too, mm -hmm. I'm too, mm -hmm. they're too, there's no two. Everybody can do yes. this. And it's so yes. exciting how mm -hmm. powerful it is because I, I, that's the other problem with the older kids. Early childhood programs exist. It's three to five, right? By the time mm -hmm. kids get to 
56 years old, they don't qualify for those programs anymore. Right. And it's public school or you and insurance and private mm-hmm. therapy or whatever you've got to go on until the kids are. And a lot of these parents choose homeschooling because mm-hmm. the schools don't have the kids have medical issues or, you know, other things right. that they just can't mm-hmm. accommodate. Right. And so that spoken language piece often gets looked past because the parent has to be a nurse and a headmistress and, a, you know, right. curriculum development and a behavior specialist and, you know, right. a spouse and, and a cook and bottle mm-hmm. washer, you know, all yeah. that stuff too. <laughs> and so the spoken language can fall to the wayside because they believe, mm-hmm. parents believe that they've got to be like a therapist and they don't. With language facilitation, yes. you can use all that other stuff, the cooking, the bottle washing, the <laughs> arguments over drama, over don't want to wear the red shirt. You can use uh-huh. it all for spoken language development with language facilitation. Yeah. So visit the website and yes. learn how to do it yourself. So if you you're can. listening on the podcast, I just want you to know that you can go to wavesofcommunication.com and that's where you're going to find all of Marcy's resources. Yep. Um, and it's just felt like it sounds waves, waves w- like the waves, ocean, waves, like the ocean of <laughs> communication. Yep. So, cause yeah, a lot of people listen to our podcast. Right. And yes. So and I appreciate sure all of that. you. Thank you so much okay. again for having me on what oh, an empowering conversation yeah. to people who really need to hear this because you mm-hmm. can do mm-hmm. this. You can teach your child to talk faster than therapy. It's Thank happening you. all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us. I mean, the wisdom that you had to share, the experience you have, and just the the difference you're making in people's lives. It's it's um, it's definitely um, inspiring. And just keep up the good work. You're thank you're, you. you're making a difference. And um, it was it's just delightful to have you on again on our show. And if you missed our conversation with Marcy previously, I want you to just search her name on our web, on our YouTube channel, go back to that because we talked about behavior, I believe, and it was very yeah. good. So I also um, have a YouTube channel, yeah. it's Waves of Communication. There are 400 language facilitation videos there awesome. for free to yeah. access. Like I said, you can access it all through the website, but on YouTube too. And every Thursday I do live Q&A. So awesome. you can join me and ask questions yeah. and all that. So yeah, and thanks Very again cool. for having me on. And I look yeah. forward to seeing anybody on the platform. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And thank you to our audience for joining us and for the comments that um, we did receive. Um, I know there were a lot of you watching that weren't commenting, but um, and we'll have a lot of people listening and downloading the, the podcast as well. But um, I also want to thank Right Shop for sponsoring this episode of Empowering Homeschool Conversations. If you want to learn more about them, you can check them out at rightshop.com. So um, next week, We are sticking to this theme, and I didn't even really introduce that at the beginning of the show, but this month, the month of November, we're focusing on progress is progress. And so when Marcy was really clicking on those places about, you know, getting a child caught up, that is really what we're going to just be honing in on this month is that your child is working at their own pace, and we just need to celebrate that. And so... um, So next week, we're going to be talking with Allison Morrow from um, Good Schooling. And um, the title that she wanted me to put on this is Why Homeschooling Won't Mess Up Your Child. (laughs) So you'll definitely want to join us. She she has quite a sense of humor. And um, and so we're going to kind of look at all of those those lies that we believe as homeschool moms about how we're just going to mess them up. And she's going to give us some um, responses that we should be thinking and cycling through our heads instead. So you definitely want to join us for that next week. That sounds great. Yeah, it does. I'm looking forward to that every week. I mean, it's just amazing. Just like talking to you, Marcy. I mean, I learn something new every week and I, um, it's, it's just so fun. I, and I can kick myself and say, man, I wish I knew that when I was homeschooling my own kids, but you know what? That's why we do what we do because. Yeah, no, I mean, I think all these moms and dads that are out here now in the trenches learning Mm -hmm. from your expertise and the fact that you're bringing on people to bring a fresh perspective on things. I think it's wonderful. And yeah, good luck to all of you parents out there. I know you can do this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a great way to to encourage them because yes, they can do it. Of course. mm -hmm. Parents are the best language facilitators. That's what I always say. Yes. 
they they are they're they're i mean god gave you your children <laughs> he he trusted you with them so yeah <laughs> you can teach them so um so yeah so thanks everybody for joining us on this episode of empowering homeschool conversations make sure that you check out our website um at spedhomeschool.com for a lot of different resources click on that get homeschool help and you'll see all of the resources on our website or if you even look at our homepage. Um, see why we do what we do. We are a nonprofit and we are sponsored by um, sponsors like Right Shop and all of our partners and um, and donors like you. So you can check out all of that out at spedhomeschool.com. So have a great night, everybody. And we'll see you next week right here on Empowering Homeschool Conversations. I'm Don Hawkins, and I once heard Chick-fil-A founder Truett Cathy say, you can tell if a person needs encouragement, check to see if they're breathing. I'd like to invite you to my weekly podcast, Encouragement for You, featuring encouraging guests like Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley, Dan Cathy, the late Dr. Frank Menrith, Josh McDowell, and more. To subscribe to my weekly Encouragement for You podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. That's lifeaudio.com.